golden era of Major League Baseball, there were 16 teams, 8 in the National League, and 8 in the American League. Of those 16 teams, 3 of them resided here in the New York metropolitan area. The Yankees in the American League, along with the New York Giants, and Brooklyn Dodgers in the National League. In the National League, no rivalry was more bitter than that of the Dodgers and the Giants. Part of what made the rivalry so special was the passion shown by the fans of the respective teams. While on the field, the hatred between the two squads was intense. Whether battling for the pennant or simply for bragging rights, both teams brought it every time they stepped on the field to play each other. The rivalry was so heated that Jackie Robinson, the man who broke baseball's color barrier in 1947 with the Dodgers, chose to retire from the game instead of accepting a trade to the Giants after the 1956 season. The rivalry reached its peak in October of 1951 when the Dodgers and the Giants finished in a tie for the National League pennant. The two teams would play each other in a best two out of three series to determine the National League champion. After the Dodgers and Giants split the first two games, the Giants would win the pennant in Game 3 on Bobby Thompson's famous shot heard round the world. After the Giants won the World Series in 1954, followed by the Dodgers winning the title over the Yankees in 1955, New York baseball would change forever when the Dodgers and the Giants left for California after the 1957 season. The move devastated the city and the fans as the Yankees became the only team in town for the next four seasons. By the summer of 1959, the effort to bring a second baseball team back to New York was underway when William A. Shea, a prominent New York lawyer, announced the formation of the Continental League, which would compete with the American and National Leagues. Under pressure from the new league, Major League Baseball agreed to terms with Shea to bring four expansion teams from the Continental League to the majors, two in the American League, two in the National League. With the Continental League now disbanded, the American League would have the Los Angeles Angels and a new version of the Washington Senators, who took over when the original Senators left for Minnesota and became the Twins. The National League would have the Houston Colt 45s, now known as the Astros, and the New York Metropolitan Baseball Club, or simply the Mets. The first owners of the Mets were M. Donald Grant and Mrs. Joan Whitney Payson. 
a pair of former stockholders on the New York Giants who sold their shares when the Giants moved to San Francisco. With the help of William Shea, the new owners helped to break ground on a new stadium which would be built in Flushing Meadows, Queens. The new stadium would come to be called William A. Shea Municipal Stadium, or simply Shea Stadium. The first manager that the Mets hired was a familiar face to New York baseball, Casey Stengel. In 12 seasons managing the New York Yankees, Stengel led the Yankees to 10 American League pennants and 7 World Series championships. The Yankees fired Stengel in the fall of 1960, and after taking a one-year hiatus from the sport, the Mets hired him for the 1962 season. For the new National League team, hiring the manager was the easy part, but the difficult part was putting a team together. The inaugural Mets team of 1962 consisted of several young players who had not yet reached their full potential and a few veterans who had long been past their prime. In each of their first two seasons, the Mets played their home games at a familiar stadium, the Polo Grounds. The new Mets who called the Polo Grounds home were a who's who of baseball glory's past. Richie Ashburn, a longtime star with the Philadelphia Phillies who led the Mets with a 306 batting average in 1962. Frank Thomas, who spent half of his 16-year career with the Pittsburgh Pirates, but led the 62 Mets with 34 home runs and 94 runs batted in. Gil Hodges, a hero of the Brooklyn Dodgers' glory years who played a combined 65 games in the Mets' first two seasons. Don Zimmer, another ex-Brooklyn Dodger who played 14 games with the Mets in 62. Roger Craig, another ex-Dodger who lost 46 games as a starting pitcher for the Mets in 1962 and 63. And Marv Thronberry, a one-time Yankees prospect who hit a mere 16 home runs in 62, but became a folk hero for his blunders on the base paths and on defense. The Mets' inaugural season got off to a dreadful start as they lost 13 of their first 16 games. The season would only snowball from there as the Mets would finish the season with a record of 40 wins and 120 losses, the worst record of the 20th century. Slowly but surely, the National League fan base in New York, which consisted of former Brooklyn Dodger and New York Giant fans, would rally around the Mets. The Mets drew just over 920,000 fans in their inaugural season of 1962 at the Polo Grounds and just over 1 million fans in 1963. In 1964, the Mets ushered in a new era when they played their first season of home games at the newly built Shea Stadium. Although the Mets would finish last in the National League, they still drew 1.7 million fans to their new home outdrawing the Yankees, who had won the American League pennant and played in the World Series that year. While a new era began at the turnstiles, a new era also began within the Mets organization. The Mets began putting together the pieces of a championship puzzle with the combination of savvy trades and free agent signings of amateur players who were developed in the farm system. Players like left fielder Cleon Jones, who signed and made his Major League debut with the Mets in 1963. Center fielder Tommy Agee, who was traded to the Mets by the Chicago White Sox after the 1967 season. Shortstop Buddy Harrelson, a great defensive player who was signed by the Mets in 1963. Right fielder Ron Swoboda, who signed with the Mets in 1963. First baseman and outfielder Ed Cranepool, an original Met at the age of 17 in 1962 and who would spend all of his 18 Major League seasons with the Mets. Catcher Jerry Grody, who was traded to the Mets by the Houston Astros after the 1965 season. And a trio of stud pitchers, future Hall of Famers Tom Seaver and Nolan Ryan, both of whom would go on to be 300-game winners in the majors, and left-hander Jerry Kuzman, a 200-game winner. Although the Mets would find themselves at the bottom of the National League standings in their first seven seasons, 
the signs of progress were still there. Seaver would be the Rookie of the Year in 1967. After employing three different managers in the first six seasons, the Mets hired original Met Gil Hodges to be the new manager before the 1968 season. Slowly but surely, things would come together for the franchise. The Mets broke 70 wins for the first time in franchise history during the 1968 season. Then, in 1969, the Mets overcame a sluggish start to win 38 of their last 49 regular season games and clinched the first ever National League Eastern Division title. One sign that things would turn in the Mets' favor that season happened on July 9, 1969, when Tom Seaver threw eight and a third perfect innings against the Chicago Cubs before settling for a one-hitter and route to a 4-0 victory. On September 8th, also against the Cubs, a black cat appeared on the field and in front of the Cubs' dugout. Coincidentally, Lady Luck would favor the Mets as Wayne Garrett drove home Tommy Agee with a single to right field on a play in which Agee clearly looked to be out but was called safe by the home plate umpire. The next night, the Mets received more good luck when Art Shamsky was safe at second on a blown rundown play by the Cubs' defensive infield. Later in the game, Don Clendenin and Art Shamsky each hit home runs as the Mets beat the Cubs to complete a two-game series sweep, moving them within half a game of the Eastern Division lead. The next night, on September 10th, the Mets beat the Expos to take over first place in the Eastern Division for the first time in franchise history. Two weeks later, on September 24th, the Mets would clinch the Eastern Division title after a 6-0 shutout victory over the Cardinals. It was on to the first ever National League Championship Series, where the Mets faced the Western Division champion Atlanta Braves. After the Mets won the first two games in Atlanta, Game 3 was held at Shea Stadium, where the Mets overcame a 4-3 deficit to beat the Braves 7-4 and clinched their first ever National League pennant. The Baltimore Orioles, the best team in baseball during the 1969 regular season, awaited the Mets in the World Series. Tom Seaver started, but fell behind early as a leadoff homer from Don Buford in the first inning, followed by a three-run fourth inning, led the Orioles to a 4-1 victory. But led by Jerry Kuzman, the Mets rallied to win Game 2 by a score of 2-1 to tie the series going back to Shea Stadium. Gary Gentry combined with Nolan Ryan on a four-hit shutout as the Mets won Game 3 by a score of 5-0, but not without help. Center fielder Tommy Agee made two spectacular catches to snuff out Oriole rallies each time. And now it is 0-2. And it is a fly ball that'll be tough to get to. Agee is going and Agee makes a diving catch. He's out. In game four, Tom Seaver bounced back from his game one defeat and pitched 10 innings to beat the Orioles 2-1. The Mets once again showed off their defensive prowess thanks to a key play from right fielder Ron Swoboda. Robinson has not had the ball out of the infield. Ran to the short, fouled out, ran to the third. Straight away for him in the outfield. And there's a drive to right center. Swoboda from Dutton at the target third. Here comes Frank Robinson. The game is tied. Ron Swoboda making another sensational catch for the Mets. Frank Robinson, the old veteran, is going to appeal a third that Robinson left too quickly. But Frank Robinson, here's a grab. Look at that, Lindsay. Beautiful catch by Ron Swoboda. The turning point was in the home sixth inning of Game 5, when Cleon Jones appeared to be hit on the left foot by a pitch from the Orioles' Dave McNally. Mets manager Gil Hodges retrieved the ball and pointed to a speck of shoe polish as proof that Jones had been hit. The next batter, Don Clendenin, would hit a two-run home run into the left field bullpen, cutting the Mets' deficit from 3-0 to 3-2. In the seventh inning, light-hitting Al Weiss tied the game with a solo home run into left field. In the home eighth inning, 
A pair of Met doubles and a Baltimore fielding error pushed across two more runs to give the Mets the lead 5-3. Then, in the top of the ninth, Jerry Kuzman got Davey Johnson to fly out to Cleon Jones in left field, and the Mets won their first ever World Series championship. Don Clendenin, who hit 357 with three home runs against the Orioles, would be named the World Series most valuable player. To this day, some call the Mets' victory over the Orioles one of the biggest upsets in professional sports history. Although their dramatic victory would not carry over into the 1970 season, the Mets still had their share of magical moments in the ensuing years. Seaver would strike out 19 batters in a game against the Padres in 1970. Pitcher John Matlack would be the National League's Rookie of the Year in 1972 and co-All-Star Game Most Valuable Player in 1975. Tragedy would also strike the Mets when on April 2nd, 1972, just 13 days before the start of the season, Gil Hodges passed away from a heart attack just two days before his 48th birthday. His death devastated the Mets and their fans. The day of Hodges' funeral, April 6, 1972, the Mets promoted Yogi Berra to be the new manager. After three consecutive 83-win seasons, the Mets started the 1973 season on an up-and-down note. Although their pitching staff was among the best in baseball, injuries swarmed their batting order. On July 9th, the Mets were in a deep slump, having lost 16 of their previous 24 games and sinking into last place in the Eastern Division. Mets co-owner M. Donald Grant called a team meeting to try and rectify the situation. It was then that reliever Tug McGraw uttered the famous phrase, you gotta believe. That September, the Mets ended the season by winning 19 of their last 27 games to win the National League's Eastern Division title for the second time. One other notable moment of that season was the retirement of longtime star Willie Mays, who had been traded to the Mets by the San Francisco Giants the previous season. Mays would finish his 22-year career with 660 home runs and was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1979. The Mets faced the Western Division champion Cincinnati Reds for the pennant. The series is best remembered for Game 3 at Shea, when Reds second baseman Pete Rose slid hard into Buddy Harrelson, who tried to turn a double play, starting a benches-clearing fight. Despite the dramatics, the Mets still beat the Reds in five games to clinch the National League pennant and advance to the World Series. It was an improbable run by the Mets as they became the National League champion with the lowest amount of victories ever in the regular season with just 82. The Mets would face the heavily favored American League champion Oakland Athletics in the World Series. The series contained many angles. One, Willie Mays drove home Buddy Harrelson with a single in extra innings of Game 2 at Oakland to give the Mets the victory. It would also be Mays' last Major League hit. Earlier in the game, the Mets were victimized by a very controversial call when Felix Mian flat out to left and Buddy Harrelson tagged at third and appeared to score but instead was called out by the home plate umpire. Although the play had no bearing on the game, it proved to be an omen for the rest of the series. With Tom Seaver starting Game 3 at Shea, the Mets appeared to be in control as they took a 2-0 lead. But Seaver gave up single runs each in the 6th and 8th innings, and the bullpen gave up the go-ahead run in the 11th as Oakland won it 3-2. John Matlack started Games 1, 4, and 7 of the World Series, Despite pitching well, he lost two out of three meetings with the Oakland starter Ken Holtzman as the A's won the series in seven games. After their disappointing loss to the A's, the Mets' fortunes took a drastic decline. Mrs. Joan Payson, one of the Mets' co-owners from their inception in 1962, passed away in 1975 at age 72. Her passing coincided with a terrible stretch that the Mets were involved in as they finished under 500 eight seasons out of a 10-year span. 
the Mets did have a few bright moments in the rest of the 70s. Lee Mazzilli, a first-round pick by the Mets in 1973, would play parts of 10 seasons over two tours of duty with the Mets and would represent the Mets in the 1979 All-Star Game where he would hit a famous home run. Tom Seaver won his third and final Cy Young Award with the Mets in 1975. Jerry Kuzman won 20 games with the Mets in 1976. And Dave Kingman, nicknamed Kong, became an instant favorite among Met fans as he hit 154 home runs over parts of six seasons in two tours of duty with the Mets. The franchise's low point came on the night of June 15, 1977, when Tom Seaver, who was caught up in a bitter contract dispute with owner M. Donald Grant, was traded to the Cincinnati Reds as part of a seven-player trade. The New York media infamously called that night the Midnight Massacre. While Seaver won 75 games in five and a half seasons with the Reds, the Mets would finish either last or next to last in the Eastern Division six years in a row. While the product on the field was not even close to competitive, the product off the field was undergoing a drastic change. By 1980, the Mets would be sold to the Doubleday Publishing Company, led by Nelson Doubleday Jr. His first order of business was to hire a new general manager, Frank Cashin, a longtime executive in Baltimore who was instrumental in the Orioles' success in the late 1960s and all of the 70s. Cashin's plan was to reconstruct the farm system, which had been dormant for years, and also to make savvy trades for veterans that would help the younger players. After employing a revolving door at manager, Cashin hired Davey Johnson, a longtime slugger in the majors, to be the new manager. Johnson was best known for using computer-based sabermetrics and statistics as part of his scouting reports for games. With Johnson and Cashin as the brain trust, the Mets reshaped the roster with players promoted from the farm system and other players that were brought along in trades. Players such as Dwight Gooden, the Mets' first round draft pick in 1982, who became Rookie of the Year in 1984 and the Cy Young Award winner in 1985. Darryl Strawberry, the Mets' first round pick in 1980, who became Rookie of the Year in 1983. Keith Hernandez, who was traded to the Mets by the Cardinals in the spring of 1983. The Kid, Gary Carter, who was traded to the Mets by the Montreal Expos in the winter of 1984 and who beat the Cardinals on opening day 1985 with a famous home run. The assembly line of contributors on the Mets continued. Mookie Wilson, Lenny Dykstra, Sid Fernandez, Wally Backman, Ron Darling, Bobby Ojeda, Ray Knight were among the many Mets that helped the franchise make a dramatic turnaround. In six full seasons with Davey Johnson as the skipper, the Mets finished no worse than second place in the Eastern Division. With their core complete, the Mets broke a 16-year postseason drought on the night of September 17, 1986, when they beat the Cubs to clinch the National League's Eastern Division title. The Mets finished the season with 108 victories, firmly establishing themselves as the best team in baseball and cruising into the National League Championship Series against the Houston Astros. In a series full of dramatics and big hits from players like Dykstra and Carter, the Mets beat the Astros to clinch their first National League pennant since 1973. In the World Series, the Mets would face a hungry group of Boston Red Sox. After the Red Sox won the first two games at Shea, the Mets set the tone in the next two games at Fenway Park in Boston as Dykstra and Carter hit big home runs to tie the series. The Red Sox won Game 5 to lead the series 3-2 and led Game 6 by a score of 6-4 in the bottom of the 10th inning, needing one strike to win their first title since 1918. But then Carter, Kevin Mitchell, 
and Ray Knight followed with consecutive singles to put the Mets within a single run. With Mookie Wilson at the plate, a wild pitch scored Mitchell to tie the game. Moments later, the legendary radio voice of the Mets, Bob Murphy, would describe the following call. At a ground ball, quickly, it is a fair ball. Six by Buckner, rounding third night. The Mets will win the ball game. The Mets win. Bill Buckner's error at first allowed the game-winning run to score, and the Mets would win it 7-6. to six. Buckner would remain a hated man by Bostonians because of that play for almost two decades. In Game 7, Ray Knight's three-run home run gave the Mets the lead for good as they beat the Red Sox 8-5 and would win the championship in seven games. It was their first championship since 1969. The Mets would return to the postseason two years later when they won the Eastern Division title in 1988, but they would lose in the National League Championship Series to the Los Angeles Dodgers in seven games. After their disappointing loss to the Dodgers, the Mets took a nosedive into the National League Eastern Division cellar as several of their core players either were traded or left via free agency. In an ill-fated attempt to remain competitive, the Mets traded for or signed via free agency several high-priced players. Players such as Bobby Benilla, Vince Coleman, Brett Saberhagen, and Eddie Murray were all brought in in hopes of bringing the Mets a championship. But the team was so poorly constructed that one sports writer infamously called them the worst team money could buy. The Mets would go 10 straight seasons without a single playoff game. Six of those seasons would be spent under 500. But thanks to a change in philosophy, the Mets reconstructed their team. Led by controversial manager Bobby Valentine, who was hired near the end of the 1996 season, the Mets suddenly became a team on the rise. With new additions such as John Olerud, Edgardo Alfonso, Ray Ordonez, and big-ticket trade acquisition Mike Piazza, the Mets suddenly found themselves back in the thick of the playoff race. In 1999, the Mets beat the Reds in a one-game playoff to claim the National League wildcard and then won the National League Division Series over the Western Division champion Arizona Diamondbacks in four games, highlighted by Todd Pratt's pinch-hit game-winning home run in extra innings of Game 4. The Mets would face their longtime rivals, the Atlanta Braves, in the National League Championship Series and would extend the series to a sixth game on Robin Ventura's infamous Grand Slam single in Game 5. Although the Mets would lose the series in six games, their run set the stage for the following season. The following season, 2000, saw the Mets claim their second straight National League wildcard. They would beat the San Francisco Giants in the National League Division Series in four games, then claim the National League pennant over the Cardinals in a five-game National League Championship Series. The Mets would play the Yankees in the first Subway World Series since 1956. Although the series was hotly contested, the Yankees still beat the Mets in five games. The Mets would not reach the postseason again until six years later, when they won the Eastern Division title in 2006, then swept the Los Angeles Dodgers three straight in the division series before losing a seven-game league championship series to the St. Louis Cardinals. In more than half a century, the Mets' history has been defined by years of tough times, followed by other years of hope and success. With a crop of players such as veteran third baseman David Wright, and young players like Matt Harvey, Jacob deGrom, Steven Matz, and Noah Syndergaard, the Mets hope to give their passionate fan base a new sign of hope for the foreseeable future.